Hi guys, a friend of mine just recently bought his first real camera and he wanted to set it up and start shooting. He emailed me and said he wishes he could find a YouTube video that just said in plain language how he could just take his camera, set it up and start shooting decent video right away. And I thought to myself, yeah, I haven't seen a video like that either. And I was in that same boat six years ago searching for that type of video. So I figured why not make it? Who better to tell you about the basics of a camera than me? People say it to me all the time. So just to be clear, this is a total beginner's video. If you have experience with cameras, this video may not be for you, but you may know some people who would benefit from this video. So go ahead and share it to them. Now, I can't tell you what buttons that you need to press because cameras are like snowflakes. They're each beautiful and, and, and unique and, and wet. Actually, try not to get them wet. So what I will do is I will give you some settings that will be good to dial into your camera so that you can get some acceptable images even though you don't have any experience. It will be very good to have your manual close by and if you don't have your physical manual then uh, you can always find your manual online pretty easy to almost every camera and that will help you navigate to the settings that I'm talking about. So I'm going to break this up into four categories. I'll go with camera, lights, sound, and stability. And at the end, I will give you some bonus tips on using your camera to get optimal results. So number one, the camera settings. You want to turn the dial on the camera to the movie mode. Sometimes it says movie, sometimes it's a picture of a film strip. Just get to that movie mode. And what you want to do is set up your camera in 1920 by 1080. This will be your camera's resolution. Now some of your cameras will be able to shoot 4K and you may be tempted to do so. And you can go ahead if you want, but you must remember those file sizes will be much, much bigger than the 1080 file sizes. And it'll be much more difficult to edit on your computer. So if you have a very robust computer and you have a lot of storage space, you can go ahead and try the 4K. But for the most part, people will actually watch their YouTube on uh, on their phones or their tablets where they won't notice the difference probably between 1080 and 4K. We can move on to 4K as time goes by, but we're beginners here. So let's start at 1080 and make it a little easier on yourself. Now that we're in 1080, what you wanna do is set the frame rate. This is the frames per second you will be shooting at. It is usually written simply by a number followed by a P. Inside North America, you wanna look for 24P uh, outside of North America, 25p. This is the frame rate for 99% of all movies that you see and TV shows. This gives you the most realistic motion blur. Now, if your camera doesn't have that, choose 30p. This will give you more of a soap opera look to your footage, but it's still fine. People use it all the time. Now, when you see frame rates like uh, 60 frames per second or 120, generally those ones are chosen so that you can slow the footage down in editing so that you can get some slow motion. So now we're shooting in 1920 by 1080 with 24 frames per second. The next thing we want to look at is shutter speed. Shutter speed is most likely one of the dials on your camera that you can use, you know, with your thumb or your forefinger. A lot of times it's the one on the back there. And uh, what you want to do is set that to double your frame rate. It's called a 180 degree shutter rule, but who cares what it's called? But what I'm saying is since we're doing 24 frames per second, 24p, what we want to do is set a, set a shutter speed that is double that. So a shutter speed of 48. Now on cameras, the closest generally you can get is 50. And it's really one over 50 because it, it's written as a fraction as in the shutter stays open 1 50th of a second or 20 milliseconds. You know, some cameras will actually express the shutter speed in, in, in that fraction, but a lot will just say 50 instead of saying the 150. But listen, all you have to remember is you want to double your frame rate. So if you're doing the 24p, look for the 1 over 50 or the 50. If you do 30p, then you want to uh, look for the 60 or the 1 over 60. Now, if you want to do slow motion at 120 frames per second, set your shutter speed there at, uh, at 240. Now there is some debate about whether in fact you should double your frame rate when you reach the higher frame rates, but we're beginners here, all right? So let's just keep it simple and remember to uh, have your shutter speed at double your frame rate. And that's all you need to remember. So now our camera resolution is 1920 by 1080. Our frame rate is 24 frames per second or 24p. Our shutter speed is 50 or one over 50. Now what's next? What's next is the aperture. 
Now, uh, this is generally another dial on your camera. On my two cameras, it is the front dial by default. Now, this determines how much light is let into your lens, and it also determines the depth of field. So when you use, it's written in, in f-stop, so when you use a lower f-stop, that means uh, the lens is opened up and lets in more light. So your image will be brighter and uh, your background will actually be blurrier. So we're all trying to be Hollywood here, aren't we? And so when you want that blurry background, what you wanna have is a lower f-stop number. And that does make your image brighter, so your lights have to compensate for that. If you make your f-stop higher, the higher it goes, the more of your scene will be in focus, and also the darker your scene will be. So if you have a higher f-stop, you're gonna need a lot more light. Of course, if you bought a fancy camera, probably you do want that background blur, so try to get your f-stop as low as you can. So we have a camera resolution of 1920 by 1080. We have a frame rate of 24 frames per second. We have a shutter speed of 50 or one over 50. We have our aperture at the lowest point that our lens will allow. We'll keep our f-stop as low as we can in order to get that nice blurry background. And we're gonna move on to white balance. White balance just makes sure that when a camera sees white, it's actually white. Our eyes naturally adjust from say daylight to tungsten. And so if we, we're looking at a, a white piece of paper with a candlelit room, or we're looking at a white piece of paper, you know, under some neon lights, we're still going to see it as white. Our eyes are very sophisticated. Cameras, not that sophisticated. So you're gonna have to tell the camera what type of lighting that you are using. Now, uh, you can look into white balance if you want to get uh, a manual, white balance to properly manually white balance is the best idea for cameras but we are beginners here and most cameras are pretty good at nailing the white balance so my suggestion is to just put the white balance in auto auto white balance and if you're feeling adventurous look into how to set a custom white balance you know uh, also cameras will say They'll, they'll have a setting for daylight balance or tungsten. So if you're outside in the sun, you know, you can go to daylight and you'll probably be pretty safe. But again, I think the white balance on most cameras will do the job for you when you're just getting your feet wet with the camera. Do you know what I mean? So I would say go ahead, do the auto white balance and, uh, you know, up your game later on. And now let's move on to ISO. ISO is a way of boosting the brightness in your camera if you need some more light. And now again, we're gonna let the camera do the work for us on this one, because ideally you want your ISO as low as possible. That will give you the cleanest image, as people say. So when they say clean image, if your ISO gets too high, generally cameras will introduce a lot of noise. So it'll just look like a lot of static and uh, discoloration and your footage will look really terrible when your ISO is too high. So you wanna keep your ISO as low as possible, which is why you wanna light your scene well. Like right now, my scene is lit well. If I didn't have these lights here, I'd have to turn my ISO way up and then my footage would look all grainy and crappy. So again, in a perfect world, you wanna set your ISO as low as you can and have your scene lit properly, but we're beginners, so maybe our scene isn't lit so properly and our camera will need to compensate by giving us an extra boost of light. So uh, put your ISO in auto. And now we come to the focusing method. Now this can be a tricky one because some cameras are really good at autofocusing, like the, the recent Sony cameras, and some cameras are terrible at autofocusing, like some of my beloved Panasonic cameras, the Panasonic G7, GH5, they're not very good at uh, autofocusing, so you'll wanna set that into manual focus. So my suggestion for you is use autofocus to start. You know, do some tests, and if your camera cannot autofocus, then of course you switch to manual focus. But the truth is, a lot of cameras, the Canons, the Sonys, uh, the Fujis, uh, and even some of the Panasonics in 1080 will give you acceptable autofocus. So make your life easy. Manual focusing is a bit of an art. It's a little bit tricky. Once you learn how to do it, you're going to fall in love with it, trust me. But right away if you just want to set your camera up and start shooting some video just try the autofocus and hope that it works out for you you will know if it doesn't work you'll watch your footage back and it'll just be in and out blurry sharp blurry sharp it, it won't look good and that's the time you want to uh go with the manual focus
And the last thing I'll mention about the camera settings is the metering. Uh, just look for the setting that says multi-metering. That basically says the camera should look at uh, the entire scene in terms of lighting. You know, sometimes you can do spot metering if like your beautiful face like mine is the only thing that you want to focus on. Like I could do spot metering right now on my face and that would work. But if you're shooting a regular scene, you know, just, just go with multi-metering. It's the best overall metering to pick when you're first getting going. So I'll give you some more camera tips at the end of this video. But let's recap our camera settings right now before we move on to lighting. We're shooting at 1920 by 1080 for the resolution. The frame rate is 24p. The shutter speed is 50 or 1 over 50. We're using the lowest aperture, the lowest f-stop that our lens will allow to get a blurry background. Our white balance is auto. Our uh, ISO is auto. And we're using autofocus if it works. Hopefully it does. And for metering, don't forget to use multimetering. And now let's move on to another key ingredient of good footage, and that is lighting. Now, one of the easiest ways to make your footage look good is to just go outside. Uh, this, the sunlight is very good, and the background will look good as long as you know you don't have something horrible in the background. But the big problem is that the sun will often be too bright for the preferred settings that I have just talked about. So uh, let's go outside right now. So when it comes to lighting, one of the easiest things you can do to get good lighting is to come outside. But in a Canadian winter, maybe that isn't the easiest thing to do. But the point still stands. The problem with shooting in daylight, often the sun is too bright for you to use your preferred settings. So if you want that nice blurry background and you want to put your f-stop all the way down to its lowest setting, then you're going to really blow out the image. Here, let me show you. So this is... So this is my f-stop all the way down to 1.4, which is what this lens can do. The background is nice and blurry, except you can't see anything. So I have to raise my f-stop. So I have to raise my f-stop right now to about f9, which means everything is going to be in focus. So one of the ways to combat this problem, if you want to lower your f-stop to get that blurry background, is to buy something like this. This is a neutral density filter right here, and it's kind of like sunglasses for your camera lens. That way you can get the f-stop that you would like if you put on one of these filters. And you can look into that if you want, but we're beginners here, and let's assume you don't have a neutral density filter. What do you do? You do what I just did, which is you put your f-stop higher, and you deal with the fact that your background is not so blurry. But let's say you desperately need that blurry background for your shot. Say there's something back there you don't want people to see. Maybe a drifter has wandered into your yard, and he's taken a deuce, and you think, my audience is probably not into that. Well, what you can do is instead of raising your f-stop, you can actually raise your shutter speed. I'll show you. I'll lower my f-stop, but I'll raise my shutter speed. So lowering the f-stop now to 1.4. And as you can see, that's totally blown out. So let's raise our shutter speed. And right about there. The problem with this is it doesn't create realistic motion blur, so when things are moving through your screen, it looks very Saving Private Ryan, very choppy, cha 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 cha, kind of like an action scene. And uh, if that's what you're going for, then that's fine. But what I'm saying is if there's a lot of movement in your scene and you have your shutter speed this high, you're going to get very, very choppy motion. So without a neutral density filter, you got to make a trade-off. Either a higher f-stop so that you have more of the background in focus or a choppier image if you're going to raise your shutter speed. I'm cold now. I'm going to go inside. Now, a good alternative to going outside, which a lot of people prefer to do when they're starting out, is window light. You just set your camera up somewhere where the sun is coming through the window and it will shine on your gorgeous face and voila, you know? Now, this is great because you're not freezing off your buttocks and the light is generally not as bright as outside side so you don't have to adjust your aperture or your shutter speed as dramatically to get the proper exposure on your image. Now let's move on to my preferred setup which is what you're looking at right now. I like I like when I'm in control. I like control of the environment so uh, I have no windows in this room and what I have is a key light right here. A key light is your strongest light, your main light is the key light when people say that. And uh, it has a nice big soft box on it. And then I have another fill light coming in over here to fill in the shadows on this side of my face. Watch, I'll show you. See, this is what my face looks like without the fill. It's too dark. I, I prefer, you know, a, a little fill. 
There we go, back to pretty. And now, uh, and then a lot of people will have a hair light in the back, just over there, shining down on their hair, giving some separation from the background. I have a bit of a different thing. I have a light just, just right behind me here. Can you see that? You know? It's not exactly what I want, but I don't have a really big space, so I don't have a lot of room for a good hair light. So this is what I've done to separate myself from the background. And of course, you can see here, I have uh, some accent lights here. I've got a blue light coming down over here, and I have another light uh, down here. You need a lot of lights. <laughs> lights are is the, really the most important thing. So, all right, all right, let, let's simplify this. What you want more than anything is one good light, all right? So if you're in a control environment like this, just one key light, you know, right about, uh, you know, 45 degrees away from you with a nice big soft box. I'll put up some links for some uh, cheap lights with uh, cheap soft boxes that will do a really good job. And uh, that one key light is what a lot of people just use. That's good enough for them. It, it lights up their face and it looks good. And uh, that is probably how you should start. Now, if you have the, enough money or, or several lights, you wanna do that three-point lighting setup. That's what people call it, where you have your, your key light at 45 degrees and another 45 degrees, you have a, a fill light coming in and then the hair light coming in the back and then all the other background lights that you wanna do. Some people put up Christmas lights, you know, to make it festive, whatever you wanna do. But the point is lighting is key and a good light actually with a good color temperature is light is measured in, in temperature, Kelvin. So at 5,600 Kelvin, my light here is 5,600 Kelvin. I have measured it and that, that is what the box said it is and it is pretty accurate. So when it comes to white balance, I can just actually dial in on my camera 5,600 Kelvin and then I know I have a good white balance set up right away. Listen, you don't need to know about that. All I'm saying, e even if it's a lamp, no matter what it is, you just what you want to do is get yourself uh, some good lights because otherwise you're going to have some really grainy footage. If you don't have the money, the time, or the patience to set up a situation like I have here, my suggestion is to do the window light until you get uh, more advanced. And now let's move on to sound. Do not overlook sound. A lot of people do, but the truth is sound is more important to your video than probably the camera footage itself. People will watch a bad looking video that has good sound, but almost no one will watch a video, even if it looks good, that has terrible sound. It's bad for your ears, nobody wants that. So you wanna get yourself a nice sound setup and that doesn't have to be expensive. The easiest thing to do is uh, probably get one of these lavalier microphones here. This is just, you know, it goes, they call it lavalier, it goes on your little lapel here. You, you can put it down. Now, mine has a little furry windshield on it right now. You don't need that. And it's just this little tiny mic like this. It's got some fur on it. And uh, you just hook it there to your shirt and then you talk away. And of course it needs to plug in somewhere. And this has a 3.5 millimeter jack. Now you can plug that. Look at how long this cable is. I'll put some links to some of these long cable type of lavalier microphones. And this thing you can just plug straight into your camera at the 3.5 millimeter jack if your camera has a, uh, a mic input. Now, if your camera doesn't have a mic input, you're not totally out of luck. You can get yourself a little recorder. This is a Zoom H1N recorder. It's about $100. And uh, you can plug your lavalier straight into your Zoom recorder, and then you will sync up your audio in post. And don't let that scare you. That's not as bad as it sounds. It's usually a, a, just a, a button press or two on a Final Cut or a Premiere Pro or a DaVinci Resolve. Those are the editing softwares, which, which you'll probably use when you're doing this type of thing. Oh, I'll, I'll tell you something about the editing software at the end as well. we'll We'll get back to that. But the fact is syncing up your audio externally and internally is not as hard as it sounds. You just uh, click a couple of buttons, do some research on how to sync up your audio in post for the editing system that you use, and um, you will find it's not that bad. But of course, it is easier if you just record straight into the camera. If your lavalier mic can go straight into the camera, then your audio and your video already match. You don't need to do anything else. Now, another way you can do that is a little shotgun microphone here. I'm using the Rode NTG, which is a pretty nice shotgun mic, and I am running the cord straight into my uh, GH5 while I'm recording this thing. So uh, you see this camera now. A lot of people think you just put that on the camera, but then that's too far away. 
and then you'll get a very echoey setup here. Let's, let's see if I can do it. Now, see, this is the audio with my microphone too far away. I pushed it over to where my camera is and you can hear it's very echoey and probably doesn't sound very good. Ah, uh, there you go. I'm just gonna make sure it's not in my shot here, but like my microphone is literally, look at this, is, is right here. You see what I'm saying? And this here is a little cheap microphone. It's a bit like the Rode Video Micro. It actually, it sounds pretty good. What you wanna do is uh, get your shotgun mic as close to your yapper as you can. And now how you do that is you buy a 3.5 millimeter extender cord so the cord extends from your camera all the way to your microphone right here I'll put links to all of this stuff up and you know and, and it's not that much money the cord I don't know it's like ten dollars this particular microphone which is pretty good is like thirty or forty dollars yeah my NTG is a few hundred dollars so you don't have to go that crazy you can get a, a, a microphone a boom microphone for less than a hundred dollars that will give you some really good sound and again I'll, I'll just put some stuff that you can look at. And again, if your camera doesn't have a microphone input, you can always go in to a little external recorder and then sync it up in post later on. But hopefully your camera does have a mic input because that makes things a lot better. And the last thing we'll talk about is stability. You will find most cameras handheld don't give you smooth enough footage for what you're probably looking for. So a lot of people talk about gimbals, but gimbals, uh, they're a bit complicated to balance and to use, and, and let's leave those for a later date. What I would suggest you do is you just get a tripod. It doesn't have to cost very much. It, there's like one of these things over here. See that? It's a tripod, it's got the three legs. You stick your camera on it, and then you lock off your shot. You just, you're ready to go. You know, you, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And the fact is, if you don't have a tripod, you can put your camera on a stack of books. It doesn't matter. All I'm saying is take a camera out of your hands and put it somewhere stationary so that you won't have super wobbly footage. Now, in my opinion, if you do all of the things I just said, you're probably going to get some pretty good footage after a little bit of trial and error. And hopefully this is synthesized well enough to give you guys a good head start. And now I will talk about the things I said I would talk about at the end. And uh, number one is your editing software. So a lot of times people are wondering what they should edit on. Sometimes your computer will come with some free editing software like, uh, you know, uh, the Max come with iMovie. But in, in fact, my suggestion would be uh, if you don't have any editing software and you haven't purchased any, probably go with DaVinci Resolve. It's a complicated program and there's a bit of a learning curve, but it's free. Like they, they do have a pro version but the pro features are stuff that uh, us beginners, we're not gonna be looking at for quite a long time. So the free version is actually fantastic. It's, it's basically a full editing suite missing a few features that again, you're probably not going to need. So I would suggest looking up YouTube videos on how to get started on DaVinci Resolve. I myself, I use Final Cut, but that's because I just used it for years and years and uh, and I'm used to it now. So I, a lot of people are the same way with Premiere Pro. It's just something they're used to. Whatever you wanna use is fine. I would just suggest if you have nothing, go with DaVinci. It's probably the smartest play at this moment. And now here's a couple of tips about using the camera that might help you out in the future. I would suggest that you buy a very cheap, it's about $10, a gray card. It's one of these things right here. And if you're trying to set your custom white balance, which we talked about, in an ideal world, you wanna set a custom white balance. So if you go to your custom white balance setting on your camera, you press that, then a, the, a little screen will generally come up with a circle or a square on it saying, fill that square with something. You put this gray card up, you press it, and your white balance is set. Now, technically, these are used to set exposure, but they will give you a good white balance point. So uh, your footage, you know, will look pretty good. And here's a tip about setting exposure for your skin so that you know that it's bright enough on your skin to get a good image out of your camera. A lot of times, uh, people will value skin at around 70 IRE. And what that means too is you can set up zebras. They're called zebras in your camera to uh, make sure that you hit the proper skin tone. So if you're just gonna do a talking head like this or uh, some kind of vlog, and it's just gonna be your face in the screen, you wanna set up your zebras so that uh, they're at about 70. Cause then when you get lines on your face for the zebra, then you know that, hey, that's about the right setting. And so the last thing I'll say is that if your autofocus isn't working properly and you need to do manual focus, or even if you just want to do manual focus, then if you're gonna be shooting yourself, if you can get someone to stand in for you and set up your shot, that'd be great, but 
who, who knows people? Certainly not me. I don't have any friends. So what I do is I put something in the place of where my face is going to be and then I focus on that. Now on a lot of cameras you can turn on focus peaking and this is something that helps uh, you nail your focus. You know, it, it'll glow red or blue or white or yellow and uh, it'll let you know what you have in focus. So that's it. Thanks for watching. I hope this was helpful in some way. I know it can be overwhelming at first, but you know, you just watch this video a couple times. No time at all. You're, you'll be the next Spielberg, Tarantino, whoever you like. You'll, you'll be them. I guarantee it. Absolutely. In writing. I'll give you 20 bucks if you're not Tarantino. Okay. Bye-bye now. You see what I mean by having your manual close by? What I'm saying is...